got to spend a couple of days on a military base. It's kind of neat. You drive in, first of all, and you wiggle around to even get in there. Uh, and then they have bars that can come down if needed. And um, even going into the building, it's the same. It's sort of a maze. So uh, to confuse the enemy, you know. And, and, uh, but everybody has their job. You know, I, I was, uh, we had the opportunity to talk with uh, some of the folks there, the, one of the sergeants uh, specifically, and just learn about the operation of the base. And um, we got we to gotta have some MREs, by the way. So um, hats off. I know some of you guys have been there, done that. Um, but these were actually pretty good. So, um, uh, but it's crazy how you cook it. Anyways, I, I don't want to get distracted. But the, the idea of post, right? Everybody has their job, right? And, and you think of, of what it takes to go to war. You, you know, I, I'm always impressed in whether it's, you know, back in the days of wooden fleets or, or, or you know, modern day Air Force or Navy. And, and it, when, like, you, you span out over the ocean, there's all these ships, right, and uh, going to, to do their, their thing. But, but even to get to that point, right, the effort and the uh, time and coordination uh, to get to that point of being able to go to battle and then to feed the soldiers along the way. And, and, and anyways, everybody has their job. And it's no different in this spiritual battle uh, that we are in, right? We all, in the spiritual life that we live, we all have a call. We all have gifts. We all have an important place. And just like in that military analogy, if you back up along the way, if, if any of those folks, you know, don't do their job, it could create a lot of difficulty downstream. You know, those of you who work in manufacturing, you know, something doesn't go right up here. By the time you get down here, it could create all sorts of havoc. Right, and so for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and followers of Jesus, right, it's it's important for us to uh, man our post wherever it is that God has us uh, to do what He has for us. So let's let's take a peek here at uh, verse one of Second Kings chapter one. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Right, so one thing that Ahab, from a leadership standpoint, had done well is he had he had rel- he had kind of kept peace as far as neighbors go and so after his death uh, Moab rebelled against Israel kind of testing the new leader that's not uh, completely unusual practice right now Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick so the king there right Uh, so he sent messengers telling them go inquire of Baal Zebub the the god of Ekron whether I shall recover from this sickness so that the new king of Israel is up you know, in his chamber, and he falls, a a story or more, and he becomes uh, maimed, and so he's he's in his bed, and he's asking his servants to go uh, to Ekron to check with Beelzebub, you recognize that name uh, from the New Testament, Beelzebub, really, um, and he says to go inquire of this God whether he's going to recover. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, right? We're familiar with Elijah, of course, the, the prophet. Arise, and go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So in other words... You know, he, he's well aware that there is, in fact, is a God of, in Israel. Yet he's having his servants go to this false God, right, uh, to inquire. And God, sa- God says, you know, why didn't you just come to me? I mean, he was fully aware. Right? We, we've seen his sort of uh, challenged relationship, put it that way, with Elijah in the past. He fully knows there's a prophet in Israel, God in Israel, that he could have and should have inquired of, but he did not. So God says, why didn't you come to me with this? Um, and now, therefore, he tells him, you're not going to recover. In fact, the bed that you are laying in, you're going to die in. So the messengers uh, returned to the king, and he said to them, why have you returned? And, and they said to him, 
there came a man to meet us and said to us, Go back to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So imagine this, right? You're sent on a task by the king and someone walks up to you and basically answers the question that you're told to go uh, and, and, and ask. And so um, it's interesting that they turned back, right? I mean, the king had given them pretty specific instructions. So no doubt Elijah uh, spoke with authority. Uh, maybe they knew of him, maybe they didn't. But nevertheless, they didn't follow through. They, they just went back to the king and told him the message from the Lord. So the king says uh, here in verse 7, what kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? And they answered, well, he wore a garment of hair uh, with a belt of leather about his waist. And he said, oh, it's Elisha the Tishbite, right? I wasn't wasn't uh, a big fan of him. Then the king sent to him, to Elijah, that, to Elijah, that is, a captain, uh, uh, a captain of 50 men with his 50. And he went to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of the hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. But Elijah answered the captain of 50, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Right? And we're familiar with the story in, uh, in the Gospels, right, of Jesus walking with his disciples and the sons of thunder, right, want to call down fire from heaven because uh, the city there had, had, you know, not received them. And, and of course, Jesus famously told them, I, you know, I didn't come to, to kill, but to, to heal, right, to seek. And, and uh, perhaps they got their example from Elijah, right, <laughs> calling down fire from heaven. Some people struggle with this, like, wow, man, the, the captain, he just went out and uh, was doing his job, and the 50 soldiers were just doing their job, and now they're extra crispy, you know, they're dead. Well, back up, right? The king fully knew that he could and should have sought the Lord, right? The God of Israel. To answer, no doubt, the captain and even the soldiers, right, should have known better. But there, as a group of people, and, and really because the king's involved, you could even uh, say the nation is not seeking the true and the living God, right? They're, they're simply kind of going about their way and here seeking uh, a, a false God for counsel. And so God judges that. Verse 9 says, the king uh, sent to him, uh, I'm sorry, jump down to uh, verse 11. That was the first time. Now, verse 11, the king sent another captain of 50 men with his 50. And he answered and said to him, O man of God, this is the king's order. Come down quickly. So the king's order is not a good order, right? The king is not doing what he should do in terms of seeking the, the true and the living God. But Elijah answered him, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. You have to wonder, you know, was there a, like a big black spot on the ground where the other soldiers had been? Uh, you know, certainly he was aware that there was already a contingency that had gone. And, and, and you know, you, you, you would have thought he might have rethought this. Um, but nevertheless, then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 as well. Again, so the king is, is, is uh, not tuned in, right, right to, to uh, what's going on. He's certainly not uh, uh, seeking the Lord. He, he didn't seek the Lord in the beginning, and he's certainly not listening now. So he sent, a, in verse 13, a captain of a third 50 with his 50. This guy's getting a little smarter, right? The third captain of the 50, now there's two dark spots, you know, um, and who knows what else is there and exactly what kind of time transpired, but no doubt knew what was going on. And the third captain of 50 went up and he came and he fell on his knees before Elijah, the man of God. O man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. 
Behold, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the two former captains of 50 men with their 50s. But now let my life be precious in your sight. So he humbled himself. The king hadn't done that. The first captain hadn't done that. And the second captain, captain they all were going against, uh, you know, what they should have done, which was seeking the Lord. So verse, verse 15, then the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and he went down uh, with him to the king. And, and so you got to wonder, like, did he have reason to be afraid of the first two? Of course not. Right. You know, no doubt Elijah wasn't. But um, because, you know, God was in control. But this, the difference is in the captain, right? So he says, thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? So the king had done this, but they're carrying out the orders. So he asked the same questions. Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So this, the, the, the captain takes him and he goes and he, tells this message to the king, same message he had said earlier, verse 17. So he died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Right? So, of course, you know, a, a true prophet of God, what he says will come true. And in this case, there, there was no lag here. Uh, very quickly, it came true. He died. And then Jehoram the, uh, became the king in his place. In the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, uh, because Ahaziah had no son. Now, the rest of the acts of Ahaziah that he did are then not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel. So, so what are some lessons that we can learn? I'm glad you asked. What are some lessons that we can learn from the end of the life of the king here and from the, the soldiers? Because at first brush, you kind of do go, wow, these guys are just carrying out orders and they're all dead. Uh, but, but certainly they're, you know, there can be cost to other people for, for our sin, right? And so uh, in, in this case, there is cost upon the nation for the, the leader, and I would say the leaders then who continued to carry out these poor instructions. And our takeaway, and I think it is certainly applicable to um, us as a, a nation today, right? We see a lot of very challenging uh, times and things happening in our country. And our, our takeaway that really comes directly from this passage is any group, or you, could, you could apply it to a group of people or a nation, but any group or nations can't ignore God and expect his blessings. Right? And this is true for an individual. Right? We, we can't ignore God or in this case, after the first warning, you could argue outright rebel against God because he answered, right? Why'd you go down? What would, what would have been a good response? I'm sorry. <laughs> Let the king fall on his face, right? And beg God's forgiveness. But he didn't do that. He was, was stubborn and continued in the way that he should not be going. And the second leader did the same thing. So we can't ignore God and expect his blessing, right? We, we see that principle throughout the scriptures. In fact, we reap what we sow. That's, that's, that's kind of our conclusion. Any group or nation cannot ignore God and expect he'll bless them. We reap what we sow. God makes that very, very clear. And so when we look at our, our, our current situation in our country, and, you know, I remember going back to, to 2015, 2016, a lot of conversation about what will happen um, if, you know, if she wins, right? And uh, certainly would have been a very different situation than we find ourselves in. And, and there was, in the body of Christ, there was sort of a, a relief, right? Because regardless, love him, hate him, like what he says, not whatever. His policies are, are, are really the most friendly towards the church in, of any precedent in, in recent history. You know, and so, but I remember talking about the reality that we, we, we need to be aware this could just be a kind of a, a temporary reprieve, right? What we really need is revival, right? There's not outright assault like, like what was shaping up and had been happening. I mean, people being put in jail for their strongly held religious beliefs, people losing businesses, 
under the prior administration for strongly held religious beliefs, which is not supposed to happen in our country. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, and then we saw the continuation into the new administration in terms of attacks on, you know, respected generals, given their three decades to serving our, our country honorably, uh, and, and now it's proven, attacked with lies, you know. And, and so it, it's interesting to see what um, uh, the, 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 or nice to see sort of the reprieve, but, but I think we need to be aware, uh, it, it's, it, it, could, it could just be that, right? What we need, as we've been talking about since then, is really a revival, a change of heart in our country. And that can only be by a mass turning to the Lord, right? Um, it's interesting the number of conversations around this that I, I think is so uh, uh, pertinent because it's, it's hard. You, you certainly can't get consist, consensus at the top of you know, what we call leadership in our nation and people just outright ignoring the things of, the, the things of God. And so what we need is, is people, individuals, who will do the right thing because it's the right thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which is doing the right thing according to God's word. Right? Not because our government's going to love it. There, there, there's many great men and women in leadership right, who would love it, but there's also many who despise it. So, so it can't be like it's because of leader. It has to be because of our own relationship with the Lord. And, but... As a nation, it's so important, I believe, uh, for, for a mass turning back to the Lord, right? We, we see uh, here uh, God's, you know, more immediate judgment, right, on people not seeking his counsel and not following him. And so I think it's super important for us to, to take this uh, to heart, right, the, 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 the truth of you know, a proverb said, sin is a reproach to any nation, but if we trust in the Lord, right, we'll be saved. And so it's important for that. Secondly, let's, let's read it, uh, pick it up in, in chapter 2, verse 1, and, and we'll see a principle from here that, just like number one, applies uh, certainly to us as individuals, right, that we, we can't reject God, ignore God, and expect his blessings, right? There's some... Uh, sort of universal blessings and you wake up. I mean, the sun comes up every day, regardless of, of how we're living our lives, right? We can be thankful for that. You know, uh, in our nation, we're, we're all pretty, you know, well-fed. And, and there's a lot of common blessings, right? Uh, and, and some things like the sun isn't going to be impacted by what happens here on earth, right? But uh, th this can, that can be true for an individual or for a nation. Secondly, though, we're going to see, and, and, and this... I think I would first apply to us as individuals, uh, but then also our nation. We'll see here as we dive into chapter 2 that our, our spiritual well-being right, should be top of mind at all times. That should be kind of our top priority, our, our spiritual well-being. It ties in. I think it's important to, to do our best to take care of ourselves physically, you know, emotionally. But, but our spiritual well-being should be top of mind. Let's, let's read uh, chapter 2, the first 10 verses. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind. So this was, you'll see here from the beginning part, that it's, apparently it was pretty widely known, right? Elijah's ministry was, was coming to an end, and that uh, his time on earth was coming to an end. Uh, so when, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elijah, to Elisha, Please stop here, uh, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, so, so remember Elijah was in a sense sort of mentoring Elisha. Elisha, the understudy says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel and the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? So again, as, as I mentioned, I, it appears to be pretty widely known that Elijah's ministry was coming to an end and uh, that it was happening on, on this very day. And so, in, in a sense, Elijah was sort of testing Elisha, but saying, hey, you know, just hang out here. I'm going to go on to Bethel. Elisha says, no way. And we'll see why in a, in a few seconds. He, and so he said, uh, so, so the, uh, the others who had, had told him that, right, 
Um, he said, I know that, you know, keep quiet. You ever been there? You just don't want to hear it, right? You know, was, you know he, he doesn't want to talk about it, right? So Elijah then said to Elisha, please stay here. So now they're in Bethel, right? Please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he, that's Elisha, said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. So Elisha uh, again said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you, uh, knowing that this is it. Uh, there, verse 5, the sons of the prophets who are at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. So he's telling everybody, I don't want to talk about it, right? Keep quiet. Quit, quit that. Then Elijah said to him, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. So a third time, you know, but Elisha's insistent. You know, he's, he's going to be there to the end with his mentor. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Uh, so the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were uh, standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to uh, one side and to the other till the two men of them could go over on dry ground. So came to this river, rolled up his cloak, struck the river, parted just like the Red Sea. They walked through on dry ground. Would have been a pretty cool thing to see. All these prophets are, are looking on. Verse 9, when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, now we're kind of getting to the meat and potatoes, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. So he was sort of testing them along the way, right, with, with this, hey, you know, stay here, stay here. And so now he will see you sort of rewarding his faithfulness, right? And that, that's what God calls us to, right, faithfulness. We can get all sorts of uh, ideas, desires, um, you know, in some cases really cool things that maybe we want to do. But what we're really called to do is to be faithful to what God has laid out for us. And so Elisha is very committed to be faithful to Elijah to the very end. And so Elijah here says, ask what I shall do before I'm taken. Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you've asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken up from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. <laughs> Talk about like toothpicks in your eyes or something, right? So he asked for this privilege uh, of, of having, you know, just this special anointing. It, the idea here is more the idea, you know, how the oldest son got a double portion of the, of the uh, inheritance. Uh, and he wants, he wants everything God has for him. It's not saying necessarily twice as much as Elijah, but I, I want everything. I, 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 want, I want to represent the Lord. I want to continue the ministry. And so um, Elijah tells him, if you see me go up, then you'll, you have it. Uh, verse 11, and so as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses uh, came down, you know, swing low, sweet chariot, right? Uh, came down, and, and chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So this chariot, you know, fire and horses comes down. You know, Elisha obviously kind of stands back. He still sees it, though, but Elijah actually goes up in, in, in a whirlwind. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. So he, he, he sees Elijah go up. Uh, Elijah's cloak had remained. He picks up the cloak. He tears his own clothes in a sign of mourning, common sign of mourning. Uh, and he goes back and he stands on the Jordan. And, and you can't blame him here, right? Uh, it, the first thing he does is he takes the cloak of Elijah that had fallen and he struck the water saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? You know, so he's testing out. I saw him go up. Do I have it? <laughs> Boom. And guess what happens? Uh, when he struck the water, the water was parted uh, to the one side and the other, and Elisha goes back over. So, and, and we'll see here that, of course, the prophets have seen that. But our, our, our point, as I mentioned, is that, that our spiritual well-being should be top of mind at all times. Right? We, we can't control 
what the entire group does, right? Whether that group uh, is, is, you know, even our, our family, right, our, our, our neighborhood, our, our communities, local government, national government, right? Uh, we, we can't control, we, we know the, the principle, right, that if, uh, you know, our nation or a people group ignores the Lord long enough, there's consequences for that, right? And there's blessings associated with seeking the Lord. But we can control ourselves. And so it's super important that we make sure that our spiritual well-being is, I call it top of mind, right? It is priority in our lives. Seeking the Lord in, in our, our personal day-to-day lives. You know, we call it our walk, really kind of how we live, right? We do that by reading God's Word, right? Letting God's Word get be, be our food, right? Become part of us so that God's Word impacts our decisions. Ideally, the goal, hopefully, is that it drives our decisions, right? It's the deciding factor. You know, I have these options, and, you know, which way is the Lord leading me? And there's principles that make many of those decisions for us. Our uh, duty is to deny our flesh, our own perhaps desires that might be contrary to that, and then to walk in the way that God has for us. We have that choice as individuals. Families have that choice. Governments have that choice. Right? We can control what we do. And so for us, and it requires discipline, but for us as individuals, we should make sure that we're, we're following the Lord, right? And, and, and so it's so important. The first step, obviously, in that is making sure that, in fact, uh, we're followers of Christ, right? Uh, I, I heard a pastor this week uh, say uh, something that I've often said, and kind of when people ask me sort of my religious affili- affiliation, I right, like follower of Jesus because Christian can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, you know, and uh, not necessarily having anything to do with, with actually following Christ or being passionate about living for him. And, and so the, the Bible teaches that these things are written, what things, the, the scriptures are written so that we may know that we have eternal life, right? That we're saved, that we are part of, part of God's family. We're all created by the Lord, but we're not all sons and daughters of the Lord, like some would say, right? We have to be adopted into the family of God. And we, we do that through committing ourselves to Christ becoming one of his. The Bible teaches that heaven is a free gift, right? The wages of sin, the end result of sin is death, the picture in the Bible of separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord by coming to be a follower of his, right? The Bible teaches, of course, that man is a sinner, right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but we can be justified freely by his grace, right? The Bible teaches that God is a just God, and being a just God, right, he, he has to punish sin. He wouldn't be true to his nature if he doesn't. That's part of, in my opinion, part of the issue in, in our nation. There's, a, there's sort of a deterrent piece of justice, right? When justice is carried out, it's a deterrent to future actions of those types, right? If someone, for example, the, the death penalty or other form of of, of punishment is a deterrent from others who might consider doing that. I remember years ago in California reading that the average death sentence, excuse me, the average um, person convicted of murder spent five years in jail. Mind-boggling. Hardly a deterrent for some folks who are given to that kind of lifestyle. You know, and so, but God is, God is a God of justice. He doesn't sway. And, and so he must punish sin as a result of that. But he's got a love. He doesn't want to punish us. And so he solved that, of course, in the person of Christ who took our punishment, the punishment of the world, in fact, the Bible says in John chapter 3, upon himself so that we all, the world, could have the opportunity to be forgiven by surrendering our lives to following his, trading places with Jesus, in other words. He is God. Right? I remember talking to a guy one time many, many years ago who said, well, isn't God the ultimate child abuser? Put his son on the cross? And the truth is, no, not at all. Right? Because the Bible teaches that God himself, Jesus Christ is God himself who willingly came down 
and voluntarily went to the cross so that we could be forgiven. He paid the price, right? The judge paid the price so those prisoners could be set free, but we have to receive that forgiveness. We have to receive that gift that is given to us, and we do that by faith. Jesus said, turn from your sins and believe the good news. Now, that's the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. And so we, as we do that, it doesn't matter of our background. It doesn't matter of any of that stuff, where we're from, what we've done, right? It all can be forgiven by placing our trust and our faith in Christ and committing our life to him. And so I, I love that about the Lord. I'm, I'm so grateful for the Lord and how he changed my life many, many decades ago now. Right? And so that's the first step in making sure that our spiritual well-being is taken care of and then nurturing that relationship through time in the Word, which is the primary way, without question, that God speaks to us. is through the Scriptures. And then, of course, us talking to Him, prayer, being open, right? It's kind of a two-way dialogue and, and making decisions consistent with that. And then number three, as we continue on, is that God has different seasons of life for us. Right, you know, as, as we go through, and it's interesting, you know, I joked earlier about, uh, uh, you know, being, spending a lot of time this weekend with football players and realizing I'm not 19 anymore. You know, I, I remember the first time, I was 10 years younger when I started riding with the, the local PD as a chaplain, and, and um, you know, a lot of the, the folks on patrol tend to be kind of in their mid to late 20s, some are older, but like, I realized oh, I'm not 25 anymore either, you know, <laughs> and like, but it was kind of a motivating factor to kind of get, or try to get in better shape. But anyways, you know, but I realized seasons of life, right? We, we go through seasons of life. There's a season of life where we're primarily learning. There's a season of life where we do. And then from a, a kind of a, a, a standpoint, there's a season of life where we, we're kind of building others up. We're kind of giving ourselves to others. And our takeaway is that God has those different seasons of life for us, and we'll see that here in a second. It's important for us to embrace our role in each of those seasons, right? Whatever that is, right? whatever season you're in, right? And when we're in different seasons, we're in different places. It's important to embrace that, hence, right, our, our title, Manning Our Post. Whatever that is, it's important for us to embrace that and live it out for His glory. All right, let's pick it up where we left off uh, because, you know, for a while, Elisha was the understudy, the mentee, if you will, and now he's going to be the prophet, right? And so right away, he turns and he takes the cloak and he separates the water just like he just watched his mentor do. Verse 15, now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elijah, Elisha, right? Elisha could have gone into meltdown. A lot of things he could have done. He could have taken the cloak and, and headed home, you know. But immediately he goes out and he takes ownership of his new role. Uh, they came down to meet him and they bowed down on the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold now, there are with your servants 50 strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the Spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And so they had seen the whole thing. They come to Elisha. They say, hey, we want to go see if maybe God took Elijah up and put him down somewhere else. Um, and he says, you shall not uh, send. So in other words, don't, don't send them out. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, okay, send them. Right? And so, you know, that's sometimes you got to uh, uh, work with, with uh, the people around you. And, and well, always, it's a good idea to do that. And they, they really want him to do that. And there's, there's some benefits, right, to sending them out because certainly it would – when they do come back empty-handed, it'll just show, yeah, in fact, Elijah has been taken up into heaven. So they sent out the 50, and for three days they sought him, but did not find him. And they came back uh, to him while he was staying at Jericho, and he said to them, basically, I told you so, right? Did I not tell you, do not go, right? Or he said, don't go. I, I know what happened. God took him, but all right, since you insist, go ahead and go, and they did. There's no harm in it, obviously. Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new bowl, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him, and then he went to the spring of water, and threw salt in it, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water 
From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. So he again, they came to him, they brought an issue to him. And obviously God moved in his heart to uh, kind of do this, this uh, uh, you know, put the salt into the water. And God used that, used Elisha in his role to bring healing. He went up there, went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he said to them, uh, he cursed them in, in the name of the Lord, and two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned uh, to Samaria. So, uh, for whatever reason, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, these these, these boys were going to harm Elijah or, you know, there's a reason God had, doesn't say that the bears killed them, but certainly gave them a, a, a lesson, <laughs> right? I doubt they made fun of Elisha after that. But, but God has different seasons for us, right? And, and it's important for us to embrace our role for, for the glory of God in, in each of those seasons. Jump with me real quick over to uh, Second. Timothy. Second Timothy chapter three. In verse sixteen, we read that all scripture is breathed out by God or God breathed and profitable or beneficial for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Right? So whatever, you know, it's good to have a manual. It's good to, to be able to be trained. And here we see that God has given us his word for whatever your role is. Right? We all have the, the opportunity to be a blessing to other people. We, have, we all, uh, once we've come to that place of following Jesus, we all have the honor of being able to share our story. Right? No one can take our story away from us of, of what God's done in our life. And that can be a powerful way to give testimony to, uh, to, the, to the power of God and to the love of God, how he's changed us, you know, I, I, I enjoy sharing that. I look back and, and you know, I now with my, uh, some of my kids kind of approaching the age that I even got saved, I, I think of the difference in character from myself at, at those ages to these solid young adults. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm blessed by it. I, you know, over the years, I've, I've joked about, you know, God wants us to have character, not be a character. I was, I was kind of a character in a lot of ways, someone you wouldn't recognize today. Uh, but I'm so thankful for how the Lord changed me and, and the impact, frankly, that that has on, you know, hopefully generations to come if, if the Lord tarries. Um, but here, for whatever role that God has called you to, know that uh, the Word of God is key to effectively living that out, right? To being able to uh, walk in that, that, that place of obedience and surrender, it's important that we understand uh, what God's Word says. All Scripture, he says, the, that speaking, of course, of the entire counsel of God is, is spoken by the Lord, and it's beneficial for us, for helping us to, to learn, to grow, to be corrected, right? And to be trained in righteousness, there we go, right? Doing the right thing, right? So that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work that God has called us to. And so... He's given us these seasons, as we see here back in our study with, with Elijah, with Elisha, right? You kind of go back to prior spiritual leaders, and then we'll, of course, continue on 
and, and we see how God works differently through different folks and at different seasons of life. And so whatever that is, right, I want to encourage us at this, at this time, I've, I've, I've said for years, and it's, it's becoming even more uh, interesting, but I think it's an awesome time to be a believer, to be a follower of Christ, right? I, I think an opportunity to be impactful. There's a lot of hurting people. There's a lot of very confused people. Um, a lot of people with no, no bearing, right? No real guidepost in life. And, and there's a lot of societal and, and spiritual, a lot of, a lot of reasons perhaps for that. But, but the answer remains the same. Ultimately, the answer is the Lord. And we know that. And, and that doesn't mean there's not tangible or more tangible and physical things along the way, right? Conversations that, that need to happen for them to realize that. Uh, loving, gentle, um, respectful, as God's Word says, conversations um, a- along the way. Hard work. Right, I, I uh, was listening to a message uh, just yesterday about um, a, a local leader, some leaders talking about reconciliation, and, and uh, one of the local black leaders was talking about the importance of relationship. Right, it's not going to be government uh, instituted. It's not going to be you know some program. It's going to be relationship among people, and it takes work. Right, to d- just speaking of one of the issues going on in our culture right now, and so. It's, it's so important, I think, that we, that we mold ourselves after the Word of God, right? That we own the role that God's given us in life, whatever that is, you know? And you might feel insecure. You might, in fact, I would think if we're living to the fullest that we can for the Lord, we're going to feel out of our league. You know what I mean? Like, this is too big for me. That's good, because God's got it. Right? So it, it, should, it should be uh, something that seems kind of big, but, but then it's going to be carried out in the little things. And so not to be neglectful of, of that day-to-day stuff. And so I want to encourage us, brothers and sisters, I think that it is truly an exciting time to be a follower of Christ. You know, we have some unique opportunities. Uh, I would say some urgent opportunities to be a part of, of bringing ultimately a revival. Revival will solve my opinion, all the, all the ills of, of culture, right? Again, not to minimize the work involved, not to minimize the effort and the time, uh, but, but uh, it's important for us, whatever role, it, it certainly is. Parents in, in, in a family, that's a, a call for us as parents. Uh, as, as, uh, as family members, right? As that God has for us as members of, of, of our church here, right? To live out those areas that God has gifted and called for his glory to help get that message of hope and redemption out into a world that needs it. Amen? Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer.